right. How many glad to be in the house of the Lord today? All right. Today, I want to kick off a new series called Reply All. Reply All. If you've ever received an email from someone, there will be a couple of tabs, and one of the tabs will be Reply. So if DeAndi sends me an email, I can hit Reply and respond to his question, comment, or concern, or complaint. And then maybe DeAndi puts in that email, he copies, he CCs three or four people. Oftentimes our inner office personnel, our staff pastors, one of them will ask me a question, but maybe it's a question that several people need to know the answer to, and she'll attach them there. And I can hit reply, and it'll go right back to the sender, or I can hit reply all. When I hit reply all, it goes to everyone in the thread. There's been a lot of questions that have come up over the last few months, over the last year, and they come through maybe the connection card in the seat in front of you, first time guests, or maybe people that go through our growth track program that have questions. So what our staff has done is put together some of those questions, and what I'm going to do over the next few weeks is answer as many of those questions as I can. And I really believe it's going to really help a lot of us in the process. Even though you didn't necessarily ask the question, someone did, but the information and knowledge that we can glean from it will benefit all of us. And so that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. And today, I want to start off with a subject that's probably not preached much on or talked about much on or even given spiritual influence on. And that is the subject of depression. It's really amazing coming out of COVID after the church had been shut down for so many weeks, 26 weeks, I believe, in a row and interconnecting. And we were um, void of different contacts and different venues and different things through the lockdown, the shutdown and all of those things. And it's really amazing how many people begin to see depression and feel depression. And it's not a subject commonly talked about in church. We, we talk about faith. We talk about salvation. We talk about the resurrection of the, of the Savior on Easter. We, we, we talk about the Christmas gift of the Savior Jesus born in the manger. We talk about those things very frequently, but we very seldom talk about mental depression. We don't talk about suicide. We don't talk about prescription drugs to help balance us out because our minds race and oftentimes drive us crazy. So today I want to talk about depression. I'll start with this, and that is I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a specialist in the field, but I am a pastor. And I know this, that if I can just get you to Jesus, he can make everything all right. And so today, that's what I want to do. I want to just kind of get you to Jesus, get you to the word, and let the word of God do what it can only do. Father, I just thank you today. Father, for your presence here today. Father, I thank you that you're going to instruct, you're going to encourage, and Father, we're going to leave here different, more like you, because of us being under your word. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. It's amazing how many people will go through stages of depression. Recently, I heard a pastor share his testimony of many years ago. When he was in, he was co-pastoring, assistant pastor at a very large church. In fact, it would be considered a, a mega church. It had a worldwide audience. And when everything was in its prime, everything was going well, job going well, he went through a state where he just wasn't connected. And he didn't know what it was he was going through. He didn't know if it was something physical. He didn't know if it was just maybe a, a hormone deficiency of some sort and what he once loved and what he once got excited about, even personal hobbies like playing golf and his exotic course or something. Even those things were now no longer exciting him. Things that he enjoyed doing, he no longer did. And he went in to have a physical and draw blood and let them figure out what's going on. And they 
they concluded that all of his signs and all of his uh, his uh, uh, blood counts were normal. Everything was normal. He was just in a state of depression. And they had wanted to give him the necessary medication to lift him out. Here's the actual definition of depression. A mood disorder characterized by that. <laughs> what that is is exactly what he was having. This is when certain things used to excite you, get excited about, now they no longer do. Extreme sadness, poor concentration, sleep problems, loss of appetite, and feelings of guilt, helplessness, and hopelessness. As I began to study and read that definition, I saw myself in a couple of those descriptions. Maybe today you have been through a season where you've experienced one or two of three of these things that are on the, on the board today. And so we begin to realize that when you begin to study depression and you begin to study the suicide, you know, 40,000 people a year in America will commit suicide. One in nine people in this room today are on prescription medication for mood depression, mood swings, suicidal tendencies. In fact, one of five have been on medication at some point. And, and here's what I've noticed. When it comes to mental depression, mental illness, oftentimes we don't know how to deal with it. For instance, if I, I saw a friend of mine, in fact, Reagan's brother Riley walked in the other day, he's on crutches, and someone said, Riley, what happened? Oh, I was playing football the other day and hyperextended the knee and it's swelling, so I just got to keep some weight off of it. Oh, all right, all right, man, best of luck. Or you see someone with a bandage around their thumb and you hadn't seen them, you saw them a week ago, they didn't have, hey, what happened, man, I was, had a hammer in my hand and man, I banged my thumb and when I did, I said, well, praise the Lord. And so it's wrapped up and, we know how to deal with physical injuries. We, we know that, you know, you can have certain, well, what's going on? Well, I, I got a cold. Well, I, I got the flu. I'm on some, it's just that, oh, it's just the allergies. And we, we know how to deal with that kind of stuff. But when someone says, we find out that they're taking prescription drugs for mental illness, oftentimes we don't know what to do with that. We're not real sure about it and, 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 you know, we often, when we come to church, we get ready to come to church on Sunday morning and we take out clothes off the hanger that, that, are, that are clean and try to put on our best and nothing wrong with that. But if we're not careful, we'll do that with our scars and our pain. We'll come and we'll have it all covered. The new blouse covers it. The new jacket covers it. The new shirt covers it. And, 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 and we end up covering our illness. It's easy to see someone on a crutch. It's easy to see someone with a bandage. But we don't necessarily notice the inner turmoil that someone is having or walking through. And, um, and so I, I just want you to realize, here's a couple of things I'll give you today. Number one, it's not a sin to be sick. Oftentimes we think of mental illness as a lack of faith, or we think of mental illness as because we're not trusting God and all these things. And listen, let me just help you. Your illness is not your identity. That, that's not who you are. It's like a wave. It's crashing, but the wave will one day rescind. And so I just want you to know that it's okay to not be okay. And once you know that it's okay to not be okay, then you don't have to hide it anymore. Because oftentimes when we're not sure that it's okay, we got to hide it. We got to cover it up. We, we got to protect it. We got to conceal it. We got to shh about it because we don't want to be labeled. We don't want to be, but I'm just here to tell you, you're in a church where it's okay to be not okay. 
Because, you know, the longer I've pastored and the more I've pastored for these 20 years, 20 years, 20 plus years, you know what I realized? All of us got a few screws loose every now and then, <laughs> including me. All right. So we're all not perfect and it's OK. So I want you to see that. And so here's what we have. Here's an, the author of The Depression Cure. Here's what Stephen writes. We were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, social, isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. And then we wonder why one in nine are on prescription meds for depression because we weren't intended to live the life that many of us currently live. I'm not gonna ask you how many have eaten fast food how many have eaten, have self-deprived, who walk in, whoo, boy, I'm tired today. Boy, I tell you, because we were never designed for the kind of life that we live. And then you throw in all of the, the cell phone usage that we use and all of the social media. You know what? Researchers found that kids that grew up 30 years ago before iPhones and before uh, uh, social media, that they're actually, they're actually stronger individuals and adults than the generation that we're putting out now. In other words, he goes back to say, he says, kids that go outside and get a little dirt under their fingernail, it's actually better for them than the kids that stay inside and TikTok all day long. You come on, if you remember, if you're my age, you remember that my mama would clean house on Saturday. Saturday was clean house day. I'd cut the grass when I was holding up. Son, it's Saturday, go cut the grass. Dad, it's snowing, go cut the grass, son. We cut grass on Saturday and I had to wash his car and my mom's car. That was it. And so my dad would send me out, son, go cut the grass, wash the cars. And my mom would say, and don't come back in this house until the street light comes on. Stay out. If you're hungry, we'd knock. She'd put a grilled cheese sandwich on the back yard and the back door. Don't come in my house. We played outside. We rode our bike. I remember one time I rode my bike all the way to Henderson. Come on, somebody. I mean, we just rode bikes. That's what we did. Rode bikes, played basketball, and fought. And ate grilled cheese sandwiches on my mama's back porch. And, uh, you know, today, it, it's, 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 we're all involved. And, and, and here, he says, this is not how you were made to live. And we live in this world where we got calendars and we got appointments and we got deadlines. And, and then we check Instagram and, and we check this. And oh, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, I got to be careful with that cell phone or I'll start looking at a stupid little reel or whatever they call them. Or, and, and next thing you know, an hour goes by. I'm like, what am I doing? Hey, come on, don't act like, don't, 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 don't act like you're not guilty. Come on, raise a hand if you get caught and listen why, over and over. Some of you are not raising your hand. I'm going to call you out. And if it's not that, it may be something else that's a little frivolous or time-wasting. And nothing wrong with those things. They have their point and purpose, and I get it. But we're not made. We weren't designed by God that way. And we wonder why people are, are, are contemplating suicide and and, and taking their own life. Look what suicide, the very definition of suicide is a permanent irreversible attempt to solve a temporary problem. Rick Warren, great pastor out of California, he wrote The Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Church. It's, his book has probably been written in 50 or 100 different languages around the world, sold millions and millions of copies. Rick Warren's probably been one of the most solid pastors of two generations. Phenomenal what he's done. And as a pastor, right on a Sunday before he was taking the stage to deliver his message to the mass thousands and the 50 and hundreds of thousands online, he gets a note from his wife that his son just committed suicide. Imagine 
that. One of the greatest pastors of our generation finds out that his son commits suicide. They had no clue he was going through problems. In fact, Rick Warren, you can study Rick Warren, maybe Google him. He has a lot of things to say about parents who have went through the thing of suicide when a child commits suicide. has some really wonderful things that will really help inspire you and, and, and help your heart heal. You can research that. But I want to look at God's Word for a few minutes. Is everybody okay? Everybody good? I know this is not a subject... And more faith and, and joy. Joy comes in the morning and everything's going to be all right. It's, but, but this is where a lot of people are living right now. And I want us to be able to help you, but I want you to be able to help others. And if you're solid today, then I'm going to give you some things that you can guard yourself so that you don't fall victim to the depression, and to the mental illness because it, it could happen to all of us. So we're going to look at God's Word. God's Word, it's amazing how God's Word covers every subject known to man. Well, that was thousands of years ago. How can it pertain to this? It just is amazing how the Word of God applies to our life and any generation in every year, every time capsule, His Word applies. In fact, did you know that there's a whole book in the Bible, written on depression. Did you know that? It's called the book of Lamentations. That's exactly what the book is. He's lamenting about how terrible his life is. And it's Jeremiah. He's sharing his depression. The entire book of the Bible is on depression. I don't know if you knew that. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 17. Let's check it out. Peace has been stripping away. I have no peace in my life. It's one thing after the other. As soon as I deal with one thing, I got to deal with something else. And then it's another thing, then another, then another. I can never get to a sense of peace. It's been stripped away. In fact, I have forgotten what prosperity is. I, I, I used to go to church. It's so busy now. I can't hardly attend. I, I, I don't have any time, even on the weekends, and it's busy, and my life is crazy, and there's things, and there's happenings, and family, and, and stuff, and finances, and pressure, and all these things, and I've lost my peace. I can't even go to weekend services. I can barely even watch online because my life is just like a roller coaster all over the place. I, and I've forgotten everything I've learned. I don't even know where to look. I cry out. My splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for, everything I had hoped for and from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. Now I'm upset. I'm angry. I'm lost. I'm homeless. I feel like my whole world is coming at me in every direction. I'm never going to forget how awful this time is in my life. As I grieve, over my loss. The entire book of Lamentations is on depression, hopelessness, homelessness. Trying to figure out life, lost direction, don't know where it is. It's, I hear, I don't, I've never underwater dove with a tank and mask. But I'm told that sometimes at certain depths, if you're not careful, or if you're oxygen level, you won't know whether you're going up 
or you're going down. You, you think you're trying to get to the surface level, but it, it's at a point to where you're not even certain. I know you say just follow the bubbles, but sometimes they get so disoriented, they don't know, they can't tell if the bubbles are going up or going down. And, 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 they get, and so what they think they're trying to reach the surface, they're actually going further. And, and this is kind of what Jeremiah is saying. He says, I don't even know where up is anymore. I had a guy, and I know my heart's broken today because I've been realizing lately how much this is so real. We moved into our house about a year ago. And there's a man that walks his dog around. You know, it's kind of a block, and he just walks his dog, and he'll pass in front of my house. And one day I was out in the yard, and he said, excuse me, he said, are you Pastor Jay? I said, yes, I am. He says, I, I, think, you know my, I think you know my daughter and son-in-law. And he told me their name. I said, I know exactly who they are. He said, uh, so we greeted, and, and I said, well, what's your name? He told me his name, and over the last year, I'll see him about once a week or two. It happens to be outside when he happens to be walking his dog, and I'll wave, and we'll stop and talk. Well, about, about a week ago, same scenario, out in the yard, he's walking his dog. He stops, and he says, Pastor Jay, do you have a minute? I said, sure. Called him by name, went to the fence, and he said, I'm just going to tell you. He said, can you pray for my wife? I said, sure. I said, what, what's wrong? He said, she's fallen into a state of depression. I don't know what to do. For the last four months, she has not left the house one time. She goes from the bed to the couch to the bed to the couch, I don't know what to do. He said, when it first started happening, I would encourage her, baby, it's going to be okay, and you're going to be fine, and it's going to be okay. He says, nothing has helped. He says, and now, I'm just angry. Now, it's my concern and compassion has turned into anger. Because I got to spend all of my day watching over her. I don't know if she's suicidal or not. God forbid she do something like that. I literally had to take anything that you could personally destroy your life with out of the house. Because I don't know where she is. And he says, Pastor Jay, can you pray for me? And I jumped the fence and I prayed for him. I don't know what the end result or the story will be. But he sounded like Jeremiah in Lamentations. And today in this world that we live in, it's a crazy world. And just about the time we think we have saw it all, there's breaking news. Just about when we, and now it happens so much that we almost get numb to the fact. Did you know that there was a mass shooting in Chicago just yesterday? 20 innocent people at a grocery store walked in to buy bananas and oranges and eggs for their family, and now they're having a funeral service this week. This world is chaotic. Things that we expect to happen do. Things that we don't expect to happen happen all of the time. And if you're not touched by it personally, there are people that you know that have been touched and and this is where Jeremiah's at. He often begins to self-talk. How many, how many's ever self-talked? 
you begin to talk to yourself. It's called ruminating. And you start repeating the lie so much to yourself that you start believing it. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we have that we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. Have you ever been there? So crushed and so hurt, you don't even know if you can make it. As I say, I don't think I can make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. This is overwhelming. I don't think I can take one more day. I'm not sure if I can keep going much longer with all of these burdens. Here's the Apostle Paul. We were overwhelmed. It was beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. It's amazing when you read the word of God with a bend towards people that are hurting. Even the greats had issues, had struggles, had obstacles. The Apostle Paul went through it. We know that it's real. Let me share this story. I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to share this story with you. It's found in 1 Kings. It's the story of Elijah. He was a great prophet of God. The prophets of Baal had assembled. Over 400 prophets of Baal. They were mocking God and mocking the armies of God. And so Elijah, man of faith and great faith and power, he says, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's build a sacrifice. You build an altar, I'll build an altar. And you call down fire from your God. And the God that answers by fire will be the God that we serve. The God who does not answer by fire and the one who does answer by fire will take the life of those that prayed to the other God. So his life was in jeopardy. And they agreed. And so Elijah turned to Baal's prophets and said, y'all go first. They erected their altar. They brought the sacrifice on. They began to do chants and cantations and prayers and dances began to cut themselves. Blood began to fall and drop as they called on fire from their God who did not answer. Elijah was sitting over there probably following his nails. He was saying, the Bible even said, pray louder, he can't hear you. So they just screamed louder. Try dancing. Throw a drum in there. Just making fun of them. And then when they were all finished, he says, my turn. He said, before I pray, he says, bring 55-gallon drums of water and douse the sacrifice. They did. He said, now dig a trench all the way around it. Fill it up with water. They filled the ditches with water. He said, now douse the sacrifice one more time. It was, there was no way that this sacrifice could catch fire naturally. He said, God of heaven, the God of heaven and earth, the God of all gods, the king of all kings, I ask you now, to light this sacrifice. The Bible says a bolt of fire came out of heaven, consumed the sacrifice, consumed the altar, and consumed all the water in the ditches around it. And then Elijah took the sword and killed every 400 prophets of Baal. It was the biggest victory in his life. It was one of the greatest miracles of the Old Testament of God challenging another, another God. It was amazing. Let's pick up the story and watch what happens. 1 Kings chapter 19. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Here's what's happening. Jezebel found out 
what Elijah did to the prophets. She was mad. She says, may God strike me down if in 24 hours you're not dead and you have the same death that you gave to those. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Isn't that amazing? He just had the greatest miracle of ever. He stood up against 400 men, but he ran from one woman. It's a whole nother message right there. I ain't saying nothing. I ain't saying nothing. What? Elijah was afraid, fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah. Watch this. And he left his servant there. Left his servant there. Then he went on alone. It's the last thing you need to be is alone. Into the wilderness. Traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and he began to pray that he just might die. Now, real quickly, we're going to close, but I'm going to give you four things that you need to write down. This is what he did. You just, we just read four things that he did. I want to bring to your light. Guard yourself from doing these things so that you don't fall prey to that. Because at the end of the day, we're one phone call away, one doctor's report, one useless drive-by shooting. It happened in Chicago, but what happens, it happens at Walmart when you were there in your city and the bullet hit your child. Here's what he did. Number one, here, this is what led. He just came from the biggest of victory to the neck within 24 hours he wanted to die. He was just saying, scream louder. Louder. Mocking them. Louder. Dance. Do the running man. Do the moonwalk. Try that. To wishing he was dead. Fearful for his life. Number one, number one, faulty thinking. You can't keep meditating on the negative and expect positive results. Get the negative thinking out of your life. Well, I'm never going to do anything. I'll never be a businessman. I'll never finish school. I'll never do that. We're never going to get out of debt. We're never going to own our own car. We're never going to finish this. We're never going to do that. I just can't do it. i just never going to do it. My kids are never going to pass math. My kids will never get out of college. My kids will never do this. I'll never have a husband. I'll never get remarried. I can tell you right now, we'll never be out of debt. We'll never pay out of this house. And all of a sudden, you just keep saying it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it all of the time. That's exactly what he did. He went, and for 24 hours, all he did was lament. All he did was process what happened and what was going on in his life. And he sat on a tree and said, I want to die. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter 4. Fix your thoughts on what is true, profitable, right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Get your mind off the negative. Put the negative behind you. Quit worrying about the mistakes you made of yesterday. Quit making about the decisions you made yesterday. Quit making about the mistakes that you made yesterday. Fix your eyes forward. Think about things which are pure, which are true, which are knowledgeable. Think about these things, the apostle says. The second thing he did is, remember he says he left his servant and he went alone. Here's the second thing that will cause you to really go into a state of depression. That's isolation. Isolation, where you isolate yourself. Where you just become alone where you don't want to be around people. You don't want people to know your business. Let me just tell you, that's why we encourage you to get in a small group. Get in a small group. There's some to get out of debt. There's some to have a better marriage. There's some to go out to eat, some to go work out together. Can I just tell you something, a little secret? And I see our workout guy, and, and I see our get out of debt guy, and I see our other guys here. It's really not about that. It's not, about, it's not about you going to work out or you walking a mile. It's not about you getting out of debt. You know what it's about? 
It's, a, it's just a little hook to get you so that you can sit with other people and build friendships and relationships so that you're not alone. You were never intended to do life alone. You weren't intended to do marriage alone. You weren't intended to do family alone. You were never intended to do life alone. God created everything in Genesis and he said, that's good. The fish are good. The sea is good. And this is good. And that's good. And that's good. Then he created Adam and he says, oh man, that's not good. It's not good that man be alone. You were not created to do life by yourself. You weren't created to do everything by yourself. And it's one thing to get away and get your thoughts together and your mind right. I get all that. Time to ponder, concentrate. There are times for that, but it's not to do life. That's why we say get in a small group. Connect. Well, I don't know if I have time. If you're the only one that knows your secrets, you're in bad place already. Can I say that again? If you're the only one that knows your secrets, you're already in a bad place. Not everybody has to know, but somebody has to know. You know what I found? When I take the mask off and I tell somebody, Grant, pray for me. What's up? This. And Grant says, man, I know how you feel. I was walking through the same thing that happened to me. It's amazing when you take the mask off, everybody recognizes you because they've been through the same stuff. You think you're alone. So number one is faulty thinking. Number two is isolation. Number three, led by feelings. Don't be led by feelings. Let me tell you something. Your emotions will always lie to you. I saw a new newlywed couple the other day. They were celebrating their anniversary and they were all. I looked at him and said, get over it. Right now, just get over it. I said, what? I said, just get over it. I said, it ain't going to last. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You don't build a marriage on chocolates and roses. You build a marriage on commitment and trust through the storm. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with a little chocolate every now and then. But that's not how you build a great marriage. That's a nut, man. Maybe that's a reply all next week right there. I got some stuff, boy. You know how you build your life? You got to build your life on truth and not a lot. Don't be led by your feelings. Listen, if you did what you felt like this morning, you wouldn't be here. Come on, somebody. I know you, Grant. You had a hard day yesterday. Maybe Erica, but I know you did a lot. If you were led by your feelings, you probably wouldn't be here today. Your feelings will always let you down. Your emotions will always lie to you. That's why you got to look to the truth. John 8, 32 says this. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You better get a hold of the truth of the word of God. Here's the other thing. The last thing he did, and you can read this. In 1 Kings, if you continue reading, we didn't read all the verses, but he starts comparing his life to other people's lives. We live in an Instagram world. How many is on Instagram? Just nod, don't raise your hand, you're lying. You want some. It's amazing what they post on Instagram. You start looking at Instagram, it's like, well, how come I can't be in the Bahamas? Well, I want to take a vacation. Well, I want a new couch. Well, when did they get a new car? And everybody on Instagram, isn't it amazing how their life is all perfect? I, I wish somebody would just post. I, I, just, I just wish somebody would post that has about 100,000. Hey, my name is Melissa. Look at my kitchen. It's a mess. You know, I haven't cleaned my dishes in about two weeks. The other day, last Friday, we had a big deal. The dishes are dirty dishes are still in the dishwasher. I opened it up like the passed out. I didn't even hit start from three weeks ago. My life is a mess. Thank y'all. 
Post that. You know their kids are nasty and they got all kind of snot running down and quit posting. You know what what happens is we, we look at that stuff and we're like, well, how come? Well, I wish my husband would take me to that place. I wish my wife would go take me to that movie. Well, how come we didn't go? Post somebody. Somebody was the other day posted posted something and uh, uh, they, they, were, they were on a trip. They had one, a, a business trip. They were in Cancun and they just wished you were there. No, you didn't. You didn't even invite me to tell me. I didn't even have a chance to tell you no, I couldn't go. Don't tell me you wish I was there. We compare. We compare our life to others. Can I just help you? There's only one person you need to impress. It's not the person on your left. It's not the person you call your spouse. It's not your kid that's sitting next to you. There's only one person. Let's look at it real quick in Galatians chapter 1. Put that scripture up. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people. I'm not winning the approval of people. I just need one person to approve of me, and that's my Father God. He's the only one that I'm trying to impress in this life. Come on, somebody. If you're battling depression, you're battling mental sickness. Can I just tell you this? God knows, God understands, and God can heal. We read that the prophet Elijah was laying under a tree waiting and hoping to die. Here's what happened. The angel, go to that next passage. I don't know which one. That's a good one. As he was sleeping, waiting to die, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside him, his head, was some bread baked on hot stones. I like my translation with butter and a jar of jelly. Come on, somebody. So he ate and drank and laid down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up, eat some more of the, eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. Here's your word today. If you're feeling like giving up, quitting, feeling like maybe God is done with you, or people have turned against you, let me remind you, God is not done with you. And the angel of the Lord today is my voice speaking to you and saying, get up, eat, get fed, get some truth in you, get some word in you, get some Jesus in you, because you're, you're not going to make it with, on the journey that I have for you because I got plans for you. And God, the angel of the Lord told Elijah, he said to him, he said, Elijah, I'm not done with you. Get up. You're going to go to such and such and you're going to meet such and such an individual by the name of Elisha. And he says, and Elisha, you're going to mention him. You're going to empower him. You're going to show him. You're going to do life with him. And he says, and I'm going to give him a double portion. And then the angel, you know the rest of the story, Elijah was caught up directly to heaven. Let me just tell you, God is not finished with you. And if you know someone that's battling mental disorder, mental disease, mental sickness, or suicidal thought because they feel like it's over, God is not done. There's still another season, uh, still another chapter of your life. Would you stand all over the house today? You may be here today and you may be one of the nine that has to take medication just to make it just to get your thoughts halfway decent so you can face the day. I feel your pain. Jesus is here to feel your pain. Maybe you're here today and you know someone who's battling. Maybe like my neighbor from down the street who's battling it out for his wife. Whatever the case may be, we all know someone. And so I'm replying all and I'm telling all of you today, God is not done with you. He's baking fresh bread. There's new life. There's new hope. 
there's new vision. And it's a new season. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you today that your word has all of the answers to every question of every generation. Father, may our life be one of hope. May our life be one of life giving. Father, I thank you that you're giving new bread, fresh bread to us and to others that are walking through a tough time. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.